I'll acknowledge it when it comes there. It'll be a nice opportunity for postgraduates to test their levels of uh, preparation or understanding. If you, if there are postgraduates here, you could ask your colleagues to come. It's just fun. I mean, there's nothing. I learned a lot preparing for these slides. I've been working more than a month for these 50 slides. So if you could take part and uh, be active participants, nothing would give me more joy. Are we ready to go? Shall we start? Vignesh, can I have you on the stage, please? Do I just press the start button? Can I have question number one? So these are teaser questions just for you to get the hang of it. In which year was Puducherry formally inducted into the Union Territory of India? You have four choices. 48, 63, 65, and 2000. This is a trial question. You won't be masked for this. At the end of 30 seconds, I'll give the answer. So the correct answer is 1963. 1963 is when uh, the state of uh, Pondicherry was formally inducted into the government of India. Can we go to the next question? So it's heartening to note, this is a very, very enlightened audience. Most of you have got the right. The highest percentage of answers is the correct answer. The correct answer is 1963. Can we go on to the next uh, trial question? So this is marks. At the end of each of these, you will have a marks which tells you who is well placed. Not only is the marking given for the correct answer, but also the speed with which you answer. If you're very sure about your answer, answer very fast. This is the next question. This is a trial question. Which famous person lived here in Puducherry, in this house that is shown here? Governor Duple. Ananda Rangapale was the Dubash of Governor Duple. Dubash means like a minister, chief minister. Third is Bharadiyar. Fourth is Dr. Tirmurugan Seren. Probably the most famous Pondicherry right now. If you're sure of your answers, you could go ahead and key in. Well, the correct answer is Bardiyar. Again, the audience got it right. So now that you've got the hang of how to play Kahoot, we'll go ahead with the formal quiz. Can we have the next question, please? There should be a picture which goes with this. Yeah. 30 year old baby, infant of diabetic mother, has not passed stools since birth, has had abdominal distension and non bilious vomiting. Given below is the radio contrast study. Which of these four options best fits the diagnosis? 30 years old, infant of diabetic mother, has not passed stools, abdominal distension, non bilious vomiting. What is gratifying to see is the number of people who are very sure the number of answers is getting filled up very fast. Either we are absolutely sure or we have no clue we are playing for hide and seek with the answer options. 
whichever way it's fun okay so the correct answer is option number c hyperplastic left colon syndrome again beautifully done most people have got it right basically it's very common in infant of diabetic mothers it is a condition which mimics a meconium plug syndrome if you looked at the picture it shows a very well descended rectum a very very narrow left colon and then a proximal dilatation so what is good about this condition is when you do the barium study it gives you the diagnosis and it is therapeutic hardly ever do you need to do surgery or invasive biopsies so that is the correct answer for this question can we have the next slide please which of the following organism species doesn't belong to the spice group spice group of organism is basically a mnemonic to find out which of these organisms are capable of producing amc this is a type of beta lactamase so when you are in a clinical situation where you have got the spice group of organisms you are looking at an organism which will initially appear to be sensitive but which will develop resistance as you start treating it so they are a big nightmare for people who are practicing intensive care group which of the following does not belong to the spice group of organisms that's a question cerecia providentia citrobacter and e coli spice is a mnemonic i'm sure you have understood that well again most of you have got the correct answer spice refers to cerecia p refers for providentia or pseudomonas i stands for indole producing organisms like acinetobacter c stands for citrobacter and e stands for enterobacter not e coli yes well done can we have the next question please a 3 year old uap munis boy has come with history of fever dysphagia dysphonia dysarthria and this picture will be shown on the picture here can we have the picture please i'm sorry about the picture and there was supposed to be a picture which goes with it so anyway that is the history 3 year old uap munis boy with fever dysphagia odynophagia drooling and dyspnea which of these options is unlikely to explain his clinical picture strep throat diphtheria cystic hygroma ludwig zangena all of them can come with huge neck lumps that was what the picture would have shown we are not getting the picture we had prepared this in powerpoint but unfortunately this kahoot does not apply except many characters so we had to modify the questions again beautifully done that is the correct answer while all four options are capable of producing lump in the neck a cystic hygroma unless it is infected or there has been a bleeding into it is unlikely to present with a febrile illness with dysphagia and features of upper airway obstruction so well done again next question please we all know that iron deficiency anemia is a common cause for hypokalemic microcytic anemia but there is one other nutritional deficiency other than iron which is also capable of producing hypokalemic microcytic anemia which of these is that zinc copper lead and selenium causes for hypokalemic microcytic anemia of nutritional origin other than iron deficiency is the question i think most of you have keyed in your answers the correct answer is copper deficiency copper iron and zinc all are absorbed by the same divalent metal transporter that's why when you keep overloading yourself on zinc 
it interferes with copper absorption and copper is vitally important for iron metabolism and independently is important for the health of the rbcs so copper deficiency as most people have mentioned is the correct answer can we go on to the next question please so can i have a moment sir many of the delegates haven't got their pin number the pin number is 1077062 can you repeat that ma'am once again for their sake the pin number for kahoot is 1077062 So this is another slightly dusra or googly question. You have a culture report of an organism isolated from sputum. On paper, the organism is sensitive to this antibiotic, but for that particular clinical scenario, this antibiotic is not recommended to be used. The clinical syndrome is pneumonia. Which of these antibiotics is not likely to be a good drug for the clinical situation of pneumonia? Once you keyed in the answers, I'll also tell you the reason why that is so. Beautiful! I never thought so many people would get that right. Daptomycin is a glycolipid antibiotic. It's called a lipopeptide antibiotic. I beg your pardon. it comes from streptomyces roseosporus the reason why daptomycin is not a good drug for pneumonia is the drug gets inactivated by surfactant so when you have drug reaching into the alveoli which is where the inflammatory exudate is this daptomycin is readily inactivated by surfactant that is why it is approved for only treatment of skin and subcutaneous infections especially in diabetics it works only on the gram positive cell wall so it is a very very good drug to cover diabetic foot and skin and soft tissue infections like your um, linezolid or your like clindamycin or your first generation cephalosporins but not for pneumonia well done again next slide please i hope the picture comes because this is a x ray based question i'm really sorry about these things there are supposed to be x-rays coming vignesh can you ask him to upload the x-rays please there is an x-ray accompanying this picture when the x-ray doesn't come there is this question is not answerable i'm really sorry about that anyway we can go ahead with the theoretical question it's a 14 year old boy with bilateral knee pain for two weeks there is mild tenderness over bilateral proximal tibia which is the most likely diagnosis of this even without the x-rays you can answer this the x-rays would have made it more um easy for you to appreciate tibial osteomyelitis growth pain osgood schlatter disease and cruciate ligament strain 14 year old tennis player excellent so the key here is he is an adolescent boy having a good growth spurt bilateral knee pain with tenderness over the tibia osgood schlatter disease is not as uncommon as we think the name suggests we think it's a very esoteric diagnosis not so it's very common in children who are very actively physically involved in activities and the clue is even though they will say knee pain when you actually elicit tenderness it is inserted it is over the insertion of the ligamentum patellae into the proximal tibia that you will elicit tenderness the joints will be fully free of any pain and all the range of motions will be there without any restriction so it is not a cause of synovitis it is not a cause of osteoarthritis or any inflammation the point of tenderness is at the insertion of the ligamentum patellae on the tibia it's usually bilateral it responds very well to restriction of physical activities and simple nsads very good can we have the next question please right generally we think arsenic is a very very toxic substance allopathy frowns upon arsenic as a poison but in siddha medicine in ayurvedic medications in lots of unani practices arsenic is quite commonly used with profound hemotoxic and neuropathic effects it can depress the bone marrow it can cause also peripheral neuropathy however there is one disease for which 
arsenic is used as an arsenic trioxide in the management which of these four conditions is arsenic used in the treatment of kalazar multi drug resistant tuberculosis acute promyelocytic leukemia and all correct so the correct answer is c acute promyelocytic leukemia there is a type of acute promyelocytic leukemia which is called the apl rara mutation where arsenic trioxide is used along with our humble vitamin a all strands retinoic acid so atra all trans retinoic acid in combination with arsenic trioxide is a very very useful drug for managing acute promyelocytic leukemia because the treatment for ml is intensely toxic regimen so congratulations to the minority 25 who got that right wonderful next question please again if the pictures are not going to come this is ah, wonderful what's the most important complication that needs to be screened for in the child with recurrent lesions in the same site over the past 2 years the mother and a 8 year old girl she has come with these lesions they are stereotypical painful swelling of the left half of the face upper eyelid so what is it that you as a pediatrician should be most worried about when you see such a child will the referral be to a dermatologist neurologist ophthalmologist or are you happy to manage these patients on by yourself corneal involvement bell's palsy orbital cellulitis optic neuritis and aseptic meningitis what complications are we looking at right so the correct answer is corneal involvement this is herpes zoster so every time there is involvement of the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve what you are interested in a pediatrician is to make sure that you are not missing a corneal ulcer because these patients have intense photophobia and blepharospasm they won't open their eyelids so we'll be very happy to give them some uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs some cold compress or some drops beware many of these antibiotic drops also have steroids if you use steroids on a herpetic keratitis it can result in blindness so whenever you have a suspicion of herpetic involvement either varicella zoster or herpes simplex please 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 do not try to manage it on your own it can lead to permanent scarring and blindness please refer to an ophthalmologist early and desist from using any local application of steroids next slide please right so as far as asthma is concerned we all know that asthma is not something we can cure we have at best only control medications available for asthma for the first time the last year's gina guidelines has introduced a new section called prevention of asthma so they have given after basis of review of multiple journals multiple public health interventions they have given a set of interventions saying if you do these things you could probably reduce the incidence of asthma in a child who is otherwise at a high risk for asthma like a first degree relative or both parents one parent and one sibling having asthma they have come up with some very clear cut guidelines which say if you do these things you can probably reduce the risk of asthma however one of these recommendations is not true i want you to key in the exception which of them is not the recommendation of gina treating maternal vitamin d deficiency avoiding antibiotics paracetamol early allergens and avoid lscs so the correct answer is answer c there is absolutely no evidence in fact quite the opposite if you have a child with supposedly high risk of asthma please do not delay introduction of so called allergenic foods like soya egg nuts legumes and pulses please feel free to give 
the complementary food that you would give any other child. If a mother is vitamin D deficient in the antenatal period, correcting her vitamin D deficiency status is going to decrease the risk of asthma. Normal delivery decreases the risk of asthma as compared to LSCS. Avoiding broad spectrum antibiotics and paracetamol in the infancy is known to decrease the risk of asthma. There is absolutely no relationship between complementary feeding and what food is being fed and the risk of asthma. Can we have the next question, please? Right. So these are the form commonly used agents that can trigger an anaphylaxis except Anybody who had listened to Dr. Narayan's lecture, which was a second lecture in the morning, lots of questions here are actually from the lectures which have taken place in the morning. There's one more question based on what Dr. Akila has actually shown. Which of these agents can trigger an anaphylactic attack? NSAIDs, IV immunoglobulin, ACE inhibitors, keflosporins. Whopping 51 of them have already answered. 52 things. Some of them are late responders, like mycobacterium tuberculosis. Perfect. So the correct answer is what most of you have keyed in. The correct answer is ACE inhibitors. So if you're on antihistamines, if you're on beta blockers, if you're on corticosteroids or if you're on ACE inhibitors, because they interfere with the mediators of the anaphylactic reaction, you can mask the effect of anaphylaxis. They themselves do not cause anaphylaxis. So vaccinations, anti-snake venom, IV gamma globulin, heroin, morphine, opioids, NSAIDs, aspirin, IV gamma, all your monoclonal antibodies, they are all agents capable of causing anaphylaxis. ACE inhibitors will only mask they will not cause anaphylaxis. So that is the correct answer. Next question, please. So this is a picture of a seven day old newborn with lethargy, poor feeding and vomiting. He's brought on day seven. Random blood sugar by glucose checks is 80 milligram. Look at the question carefully. The most important management principle of this newborn. Saline bolus and IV steroids or intramuscular steroids. IV dextrose push, correct hypoglycemia. Send off a serum 17 hydroxy progesterone stat. Get a clinical exome study. Look at the parents for carrier status. Urgent ultrasound to look at Mullerian derivatives. What would be the most appropriate management principle for such an infant? Excellent. That is the correct answer. This is a child who's probably bought a adrenal crisis. This is probably a salt losing, virilizing type of congenital adrenal hyperplasia. In this situation, when the child has presented with features of shock lethargy, please do not bother about the diagnosis. What is life saving is administration of fluids, replacement dose of stress dose of glucocorticoids, and collecting dyselectrolytemia. Dr. Aguilar has repeatedly told in many of her lectures that she actually encourages her passion, patients. The parents are trained to give hydrocortisone IM shots before they even bring the child to a medical facility. IM hydrocortisone is as good as intramuscular adrenaline in anaphylaxis. So excellent. Kudos to all those who got it right. That is the correct. All the other options are right. But the question was, what is the most important intervention in the management principle? Investigation can wait. Treatment can't. Excellent. Next question, please. Right. So we all know, again, in the management of acute severe asthma, Dr. Elamaran had said a couple of scores in the morning in lecture in Hall B. What are the components of pulmonary index score, 
we all know however one of these choices is not a component of the pulmonary index score which of these is not a component of the pulmonary index score which is one of the popular scoring systems we use to triage patients with acute severe asthma respiratory rate saturation by pulse oximetry ratio of inspiration to expiration and po2 values one of these is not a feature of the pulmonary index score சும்மா தெரிக்க விடுறாங்க அப்பா அடிச்சு பிச்சை எடுக்கிறாங்க கண்ணு மொழி பிஃபோர் த கொஸ்டின் இஸ் ஓவர் தி ஆன்சர்ஸ் ஹவ் கம் ரேசர் ஷா பிரெயின்ஸ் அட் ஃபோர் தேர்ட்டி இஸ் அமேசிங் தி கரெக்ட் ஆன்சர் இஸ் டி பிஏஓ டூ வேல்யூஸ் பிஏஓ டூ இஸ் மெஷர்ட் ஆன் அன் ஆர்டீரியல் பிளட் கேஸ் ஆர் ஆன் வீனஸ் பிளட் கேஸ் ரிமெம்பர் பல்மனரி இண்டெக்ஸ் ஸ்கோர் இஸ் அ பியூர்லி கிளினிக்கல் ஸ்கோர் ஸோ வாட் ஆர் த காம்பனன்ஸ் age specific respiratory rate presence of wheezing inspiratory to expiratory ratio accessory muscle usage and spo2 values pao2 values are not a part of a pulmonary index score which all of us apply in our bedside in the clinic next question please right so when we talk about protein calorie malnutrition we always keep talking about protein energy malnutrition however the who and unicef are now talking about a new type of malnutrition which is called hidden hunger so for every child with protein energy malnutrition there are supposed to be 3 to 4 number of children who are suffering hidden hunger which is a form of micronutrient deficiency which can cause a lot of morbidity mortality and development issues and also have profound immunomodulatory effects according to the who one of these nutrients is not a very important micronutrient they have identified certain core micronutrients which they believe if you correct these four deficiencies the entire iq of the human race will go up by 10 points that is the who estimate if you correct four deficiencies in human humanity the entire human race will become more intelligent by 10 iq points excellent copper was the hero there copper is a villain now so the four micronutrients that they want to talk about are vitamin a iron iodine and uh, vitamin a so those are the four nutritional deficiencies which have been identified by who as the top four micronutrients which need to be addressed as hidden hunger right next question uh, again i hope the pictures come two year old child with progressive swelling of the eyeballs of two weeks duration history of breathing difficulty of five days no fever no eye discharge no progressive abdominal distension or seizures two year old child with progressive swelling of eyeballs of two weeks duration with progressive breathlessness your choices are superior mediastinal syndrome orbital cellulitis viral hemorrhagic conjunctivitis and retinoblastoma i'm sorry about that retinoblastoma the last part got blasted off it's retinoblastoma i can see there is lot more reluctance in answering this question answers are trickling in instead of coming like a flood superb superb so that was superior mediastinal syndrome a child with viral hemorrhagic conjunctivitis retinoblastoma or anything else will not have any need for a respiratory difficulty the child will not come with respiratory compromise so what you saw in that child was a bilateral proptosis with lot of edema this is superior vena cava syndrome but because of the presence of mediastinal compression of the trachea the child is also having breathing difficulty so when you have superior vena cava syndrome with features of tracheal compression it's called superior mediastinal syndrome it's an oncological emergency never never try to hyperextend the neck of these children do not give them sedatives do not try to intubate or do invasive procedures 
without waiting for a tissue diagnosis you should manage this children with allopurinol controlled hydration keeping them in a position of upright with oxygen support and make sure you get steroids and tissue diagnosis as soon as possible excellent well well done team next slide please right now we have seen lot of girls becoming very figure conscious and have started doing lots of online courses where they do intense physical activity without the supervision there are any number of fitness centers with self proclaimed fitness gurus who will tell you what to eat how much to exercise what sort of workout to do so it has resulted in a disease called a female athlete triad a triad you know is combination of three clinical features one of these features is not a feature of the female athlete triad which of that is this eating disorders insulin resistance decreased bone marrow density and menstrual irregularities which of these choices is not a part of the female athlete triad it comes primarily because of unsupervised physical activity especially in adolescent girls and young women of the reproductive age group there is one more component of this which is poor arterial or vasodilatation excellent again this audience is just way too good for this quiz i think i should have raised the standard of quiz questions for a different plane you are scoring bullseye again and again and again absolutely right so that tells us what the triad is so female athlete triad is a triad of eating disorders menstrual irregularities and osteoporosis insulin resistance is not a feature of the female athlete triad next question please according to the iap guidelines which is the gold standard for diagnosis of grd all of us in our practicing me included we very often give proton pump inhibitor trial we give anti emetics we give prokinetics we give h2 blockers based on flimsy grounds like child is fussy child keeps spitting up child is not putting on enough weight gargarna satham podra mooku veliya paal varudhu evlo kudichalum pasi theerla poka alikira all sorts of reasons we are just waiting for some reason to give a trial of drugs because investigating each and every child with suspected grd is not practical i am not saying our approach is wrong i am only saying if you wanted to do the proper workup which of these four options will be the best way to prove it the most sensitive most specific it's a close tie between choice a and choice c the correct answer unfortunately is choice c according to the iap guidelines published by dr neelam mohan and dr john mathai the most important sensitive test for measurement of grd is ph and intraluminal impedance understand 24 hour ph monitoring is going to measure acid reflux when you say gastroesophageal reflux there is a mechanical part and there is a chemical part so the 24 hour ph monitoring will keep missing alkaline reflux or non acidic reflux so please bear in mind that the procedure of choice for diagnosing grd is not 24 hour ph monitoring but intraluminal impedance with ph monitoring that is the correct answer can you go on to the next question please i hope you are having a good time there is an extra isolate coming along with this 3 year old child with isolated bow legs was treated with vitamin d and calcium because the physician felt the child had rickets the child was brought for genuvarum the child was given vitamin d calcium phosphorus for 6 months without supplements after 6 months the baby had progression of the defect which of these following options is unlikely to be the cause for the child's genuvarum this is all these case scenarios are not cooked up these are all patients who have actually seen in flesh and blood these are all patients whose personal identities have been protected vitamin d resistant rickets 
Blount's disease, metaphyseal dysplasia, benign familial genuvarum. Progressive genuvarum, three-year-old child on six months of vitamin D, calcium, phosphorus supplements. The correct answer is vitamin D resistant rickets, not the choice of Blount's. See, what this is showing is absolutely no features of rickets. So there are causes and causes of genuvarum. You can have a physiological genuvarum which outgrows by the age of two and a half to three years. This is a three-year-old child, which is not the age group at which you should be seeing genuvarum in the first place. Two, if this child had had rickets, the child's nutritional rickets would have responded to vitamin D, calcium, phosphorus. If it was indeed vitamin D resistant rickets, the X-ray would show features of rickets and the child will not show response. But if you looked at the X-ray, there is not a single feature there to suggest rickets. So that is the point, that is the take home which I want to give to this audience that each and every bow leg is not vitamin D deficiency state. Please at least do a calcium phosphorus alkaline phosphatase. Try to make a biochemical diagnosis of rickets before you pump them up with vitamin D calcium phosphorus without any basis. That is the take home from this case scenario. This child actually has Janssen's metaphyseal dysplasia, exome proven. Clinical exome proven metaphyseal dysplasia. The child's mother also has the same disease. Next slide, please. Right, so people who are doing intensive care pediatrics will agree with me that carbapenems, meropenem and piperacillin tazobactam have been two eyes of our practice in acutely unwell children. These are two drugs which have consistently given us good results. However, indiscriminate use without any supervisory regulation like an antibiotic surveillance program has led to increasing resistance to carbapenems. Which of the following is not a mechanism of resistance to carbapenems? Carbapenems can be resistant by the bacteria by multiple mechanisms. Which of these is not a mechanism of resistance to carbapenems? In our own NICU, in the last month, we have had two Klebsiella pneumonia septicemia where no antibiotic has helped. No, zero, pan resistant. It's horrible to see. These are all newborn babies who are coming with fulminant sepsis. Excellent. The correct answer is extended spectrum beta lactamase. So, Carbapenems are inactivated by an enzyme called carbapenemase. Extended spectrum beta lactamase group producing organism, carbapenems are the drugs of choice. So when you have meropenem resistance, meropenem works primarily by concentrating into the porin channels and altering the penicillin binding protein. So the bacteria develop resistance to meropenem either by changing the porin channels or by actively exporting the drug from the bacterial cell outside into the environment or by changing the uh, conductance of the drug. But the mechanism to inactivate carbapenem is not ESBL, it's carbapenemase. So that was a correct answer. Next slide. Right. So this is a five day old newborn with myoclonic seizures, poor cry and lethargy at 48 hours. Physical examination, neuroimaging MRI, metabolic screen, CSF are all normal. The EEG is remarkable for birth suppression pattern. Which form of neonatal encephalopathy is this child most likely to have? Day 5 newborn, absolutely normal natal, antenatal, neonatal period, normal transition, is come with intractable seizures with a predominance of myoclonic seizures. MRI normal, CSF normal, calcium, magnesium, RBS normal, metabolic screens normal. Oof. This audience needs no quizzing. The correct answer is Otahara syndrome. Otahara syndrome is otherwise called early infantile epileptic encephalopathy. It comes exactly like this. 
normal newborn normal transition period physically unremarkable mri metabolic screen everything comes normal you do a clinical exome that also very often comes normal but the child will have intractable seizures very very pharmaco resistant seizures so whenever you see a newborn with seizures don't jump into the conclusion of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy take the time to evaluate the baby's brain structurally to see whether there is some metabolically treatable cause third look for structural malformation fourth always screen sepsis look for simple metabolic reversible causes like hypoglycemia hypocalcemia however when you see all investigations coming negative but the baby is continuing to have myoclonic seizures in the infantile period and the eeg shows a birth suppression pattern your diagnosis is going to be very restricted to a very very few conditions otaharas is one of them why is it so because these patients don't do well this is one child we are very very happy to refer to a pediatric neurologist don't try to manage and get a bad name for yourself that is a take home from this excellent next please so this is primarily to see how many of us actually look at the ears of our patients so this is what i saw on the otoscopy of a child who's come with frequent history of colds coughs and fevers what is this otoscopic appearance most consistent with acute otitis media otitis media with effusion bullous meningitis and chronic separative otitis media the top left hand corner what you see in the white color is not pus it is just reflected light from the fiber optic source so please don't confuse that for pus what you see in the top left corner of the picture is normal it's an intact membrane you can also see the number of participants is also steadily rising excellent i am very happy to know whether we are doing otoscopy or not at least we know what ome looks like so the correct answer is otitis media with effusion the three most important characters on an otoscopy to make a diagnosis of acute otitis media are erythema the membrane should look absolutely cherry red two it should have a bulging outside it should be bulging towards the observer third if you are in the habit of doing a pneumatic otoscopy reduce mobility if you find these three findings you are almost always treating with a bacterial acute otitis media in this picture you saw there was no erythema there was no bulging and you could see multiple air fluid levels so the correct diagnosis was otitis media with effusion next please right four year old child with incidentally picked up hypertension on further evaluation had metabolic alkalosis and hypokalemia all of these are likely differentials except four year old child hypertension hypokalemia metabolic alkalosis what is this child least likely to have barters sorry b is renal artery stenosis it says c here barters b is renal artery stenosis c is 11 beta hydroxylase d is primary hyperaldosteronism hypertension hypokalemia metabolic alkalosis most likely diagnosis which is not a dd so fairly straight forward question i thought oops the correct answer is actually barter syndrome barter syndrome is characterized by phenomenal production of prostaglandin e as you know prostaglandin e is a vasodilator so even though patients have very high levels of renin and aldosterone in barters the high prostaglandin will protect this patient from hypertension all the four conditions listed here produce metabolic alkalosis they produce hypokalemia but the question was hypertension with hypokalemia with metabolic alkalosis so the wrong choice was barter syndrome i'm 
sorry to say that that was not the preferred option by the majority of them second can we have the next slide please next slide right 3 kg term normal delivered male newborn skin lesions were noticed at birth antenatal neonatal physical examination were normal physical examination is normal cbc crp normal blood culture is sterile which of these options is this child most likely to fit well appearing 3 kg male child with these lesions on the skin disseminated candida candidemia with candidal skin infection b histiocytosis langer hansel histiocytosis c staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome d transient neonatal pustular melanosis excellent i think that was a no brainer well appearing child is the clue here well appearing child normal newborn period all the other differentials langer hansel histiocytosis candidemia enough to produce disseminated candidal infection staphylococcal skin syndrome chill will be acutely ill this is a well appearing term baby with absolutely no risk factors this clinical picture is most consistent with transient neonatal pustular melanosis which is a benign cutaneous lesion can we go on to the next slide please right so this is something which we have been drilled into us again and again when you have anemia when you have thrombocytopenia with acute kidney injury especially when the peripheral smear shows cystocytes we are very very fond of making a diagnosis of hemolytic uremic syndrome thankfully with improved sanitation the form of typical hemolytic uremic syndrome that we saw with shigella is going down it is very very uncommon these days to see dysentery associated hemolytic uremic syndrome so other causes have started coming up in its place so here the diagnosis is not in doubt what we are looking at is what are the etiological considerations so when a child comes with hemolytic uremic syndrome what are the things that your mind should think of and what you should not include in the dd correct so this was also a bit of a googly question the correct answer is option b thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura is typically a disease of ladies of the child bearing age group 15 to 40 years along with hemolytic uremic syndrome it is also a condition which causes thrombotic microangiopathy so you will see anemia you will see thrombocytopenia but what is unique about thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura is cns complications very typically it is seen in the postpartum period it is a very 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 uncommon cause for acute kidney injury sle disorders of complement are coming up increasingly especially disorders of complement where antibodies to factor h are implicated as a commonest cause of hemolytic uremic syndrome in indian children by a group from all india institute of medical sciences division of pediatric nephrology so complement disorders are the commonest causes of hemolytic uremic syndrome in pediatrics in our country today next please again this is a picture quiz this is a child with severe acute malnutrition is gastric lavage is shown positive for gene expert for mycobacterium tuberculosis complex two months after starting att these skin lesions started appearing what are these skin lesions most consistent with i'm sure, sorry about the quality of the picture i'm sure you are able to see something severe acute malnourished child etiological consideration tuberculosis he did not have these skin lesions at the beginning of att once att was started these lesions these nodular eruptions came on the skin what are we looking at tuberculosis lupus vulgaris scrofuloderma 
disseminated candidiasis in a malnourished child. Sariyotapu Parakotukang answers, 66 responses. Excellent. So this is something like an iris, immune reconstitution inflammation syndrome. What you saw in that picture was a hypersensitivity response to the tuberculoprotein in the skin mediated by activated lymphocytes with good nutrition, with introduction of ATT. When a lot of mycobacterium tuberculosis organisms are dying, the body produces an intense inflammatory response, what we call the paradoxical worsening before the improvement. So those are tuberculates. So even if you biopsy them, you will see nothing to do with mycobacterium tuberculosis because it's an immune phenomenon. It's something like erythema nodosum, if you want to think of an analogy to that. Next slide, please. Right. So in a dengue season, when you are practicing intensive care pediatrics, when you are treating children with febrile neutropenia, children with leukemia, children who have aplastic anemia, very often we need to use platelet transfusions, not in dengue, but in other conditions. So we have two choices, random donor platelets and single donor platelets. Single donor platelets are considered superior. They have many advantages. As compared to single donor platelet, random donor platelet is what we all routinely use. So which of these options about single donor platelets is wrong? When we say we are giving platelet transfusion to a child, when we are giving platelet rich plasma, almost always we are using RDP, random donor. Preferred is single donor. Which is the wrong option as regarding single donor platelets? The correct answer is answer C. Single donor platelets is taken from the patient by using a special machine called a cytoapheresis or apheresis. You take the blood of the patient, use a small filter, get only platelets out and put back the RBCs, neutrophils, plasma and RBC back into the patient. So the method of producing single donor platelet is called cytoapheresis. We use a machine called Cope Spectra for this purpose. All the other are advantages. Single donor platelets contain more platelets. So the platelet increment will be better. It produces fewer febrile reactions, fewer sensitizations, and it is obviously the better choice. But for a one-off usage, random donor platelet, which is more widely available, is good enough. But the preferred, if you want to say what is the platelet of choice, the correct answer is single donor platelets. Next slide, please. Right. This is a common scenario which we all face in our day-to-day -day practice. Three-year-old developmentally normal child who started with febrile fits from the age of six months, seven months, eight months. Then subsequently, the child started having seizures with fever, without fever also. There is a positive family history in the father who's also had the same history of febrile fits and afebrile fits. He was on anticonvulsants and subsequently did well. What is the most likely diagnosis here? Starts off as febrile fits, but then without any febrile trigger also, the child starts having seizure disorder. Clinical examination is normal. EEG is abnormal. I'm sorry, because of word constraints, I have not been able to give enough clues. EEG is abnormal. It's consistent with the generalized epileptiform discharge. Very good. Generalized epilepsy with febrile seizures plus is a newly coined terminology according to the International League Against Epilepsy. These are the patients we need to be watchful for because febrile fits, we are all past masters. We know what to do. We give intermittent prophylaxis. We counsel them per seria pedo. But this is one condition where purpose seria pohad, positive family history, abnormal EEG, typical history of febrile seizures, no afebrile seizures are all pointers in favor of this child having something other than a simple febrile fits. So this is the uh, correct option, generalized epilepsy febrile seizures plus syndrome. This is caused by a sodium channelopathy 
and they usually require two to three years of anti-epileptic drugs. Right. I can see the buzzer going off. I have another 15 slides to go, but I can stop it here. Absolutely no problem. I do not want to stand in the way of the timing. I wholeheartedly and very sincerely congratulate the team of Puduvai Pedicon for having got this meeting up in the first place. And also with folded hands, give them a big, big heartfelt thanks for giving me an opportunity to share some interesting case scenarios. Thanks a lot. If there are any doubts or controversies about the answers that I have kicked in, I don't want to drag on. I'm available there. You can come and fire me if you want. I'm here. Thank, Thank you, you so much, sir, for making the session very interesting. Do we know the winners, sir? Do we know the winners, sir? Some funny Dr. Horcrux. Will Horcrux please stand up so that we can see you and congratulate you? Who is Horcrux? Oh, lovely. Well done, doctor. May we know your actual name in case she lost? I think she didn't want to be embarrassed, so she's given a pseudo name. Ma'am, can you please identify yourself, your institute? Your teacher would be proud of you. Congratulations also to Ashwin R. Ashwin, put up your hand, Ashwin. Well done, Ashwin. MR for me is mentally retarded, but this MR is far from that. Who is MR? Congratulations. Well done, well done, well done. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Mari Priyanka from Institute of Child Health Egmo. Thank you. The winners of today will get a certificate tomorrow. I uh, request Dr. Janani Shankar to hand over the memento to Dr. Ashwat Durai for me. Thank you. 